Hello and welcome to the next lecture in Bio 110. Today we're going to be looking at chap information in chapter 15. So now, as usual, I am putting here the objectives of the chapter, so I'm going to leave them for you to evaluate on your own. Here is the first set of objectives, and here is the second set of objectives. Now, when we take a look inside the cell, what we find, as you know, are a complex structure and a complex array of organelles. Those organelles are membrane bound and what that effectively creates are internal environments within the organelles which are different than the environments in the cytoplasm. So we have a nuclear membrane, that nuclear membrane is going to allow the environment within the nucleoplasm to be different from the environment of the cytoplasm. We have the endoplasmic reticulum, we have lysosomes, peroxisomes, of course the mitochondria, and all those environments are going to be different and the membrane is going to allow the differentiation and separation of those environments. On your own, I would like you to review table 15.1 so you can see the, function, the general function of the organelles. And what we're going to be doing today, it's looking at three major organelles. We're going to be looking at the nucleus, shown over here. We're going to be looking at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, shown over here um, with the ribosomes attached to it. And we're going to also be looking at the mitochondria a little bit more. Eventually in the chapter, we're going to take a look and see um, how the membranes which are generated inside the endoplasmic reticulum are able to move all the way to the Golgi as well as the plasma membrane. So again, take a look at that and this is going to be the focus of the chapter. So let's begin by thinking about those different macroenvironments. One of the things that you're going to notice is that there's going to be different proteins in each of those environments. And we have then to figure out how does the cell understands um, the location, the ultimate location of those proteins. If the proteins are going to be generated in the cytoplasm, how do they reach the nucleus? If they're going to be generated uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum, how are they going to reach the plasma membrane? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. One of the things that we're going to be able to see is that protein sorting is going to require a signal and that signal needs to be understood by a receptor. So the proteins are going to have a signal sequence that is going to direct them to their destination and you're going to have different receptors that are going to understand and help sort um, the ultimate distant ultimate destination excuse me of those proteins you're also going to have chaperone proteins that are going to keep those proteins in place and protected from degradation as well as the use of energy to allow for transport so the signal that is going to be required to allow those proteins to get to their ultimate destination sort of the address that is indicated within the protein um, sequence it's encoded by a signal peptide so here in this table we have examples of signal peptides which are required to import proteins into the endoplasmic reticulum. So a protein that has tag with this extensive array of amino acid sequence will they be imported into the endoplasmic reticulum. We have a signal that is required to keep the proteins in the endoplasmic reticulums called KDEL. So that's going to be this short four uh, amino acid sequence over here. We have another sequence that is required um, to allow importation of proteins in the mitochondria. One to allow importation of proteins inside the nucleus with um, four lysis and arginine, so it's extremely uh, positive. And another one um, required to be used for importation in the peroxisomes. So this sequences present on a molecule are going to help direct that molecule into a particular organelle. This is the address, but the address cannot be understood if you don't have a sorter designed to be able to separate those. And those are going to be the receptors. So what we're going to see is like why in a sense um, were the sequence discovered and they were originally thought, it's like, you know what, we believe that there's going to be sequences in the proteins that are going to allow them to move to a, a, a target. 
and they decided to look at the sequences of many different proteins and compare them and then they found certain sequences that seem to have been conserved along proteins that went into the endoplasmic reticulum and then they decided to do the experiment. Okay, so we think we have the sequence that is uh, consensus and required for signaling. So we have here a protein that goes into the ER, this one in blue, and it has an ER signaling sequence. Normally, this will target this blue protein inside the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, and that sequence is missing in proteins that are going to be in the cytoplasm, shown here in green. So what will happen if we swap this sequence from the protein in the ER to the protein that usually uh, is a has a location inside the cytoplasm? So what they did the experiment, they removed the signal sequence from the ER protein and it, they put it and engineer a cell to put it on the cytoplasmic protein and then they observed what was the result of the experiment. And what they found was that the usually cytoplasmic protein that now has the endoplasmic reticulum signal will now be present in the ER and the protein that usually is present in the ER and lacks the ER signal sequence is no longer present in the ER and is now present in the cytoplasm. So that was the initial indication that they were right about the fact that those sequences led to the localization of a particular protein to a target organelle. So what we're going to start today is to look, be, to begin to look at the proteins that are going to be targeted into the nucleus. That's what's going to be the first um, part of the lecture. So now, the nucleus is an interesting organelle on its own because it is an organelle that has a double membrane. You have an outer nuclear membrane and you have an inner nuclear membrane and that membrane it's continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. So it has a inside part which we call the lumen and that is going to separate the environment, uh, the membrane is going to separate the environment of the cytoplasm in the outside and the nucleoplasm in the inside of the nucleus to allow transport of molecules from the inside of the nucleus to the outside and vice versa there are nuclear pores and those nuclear pores is what I'm going to show you in a moment. So when we think about the nucleus, um, the nucleus it's supported, as you know, by an internal array of nuclear laminin. Those are intermediate filaments. Those intermediate filaments are going to help provide the structure for the nucleus and they're going to be assembled and disassembled when the nucleus is uh, destroyed to allow for mitosis. So here in this image, as you can remember from the previous chapter that we covered, 17, you have the mesh of intermediate filaments that composes the nuclear lamina and that is going to give the structure to the nucleus. Now, at the nuclear pores, what we have are a nuclear complex that has and spans the double nuclear envelope. So in the inside of the nucleus, where the nucleoplasm is found, you have a structure with uh, spokes, proximal filaments, and what was called the nuclear basket, forming a filter ring. You have a area with cytoplasmic rings that are going to uh, allow the structure to assemble nicely and then in the outside next to the cytoplasm what we have are cytoplasmic filaments. You also have proximal filaments within the um, central transporter region. Anyway, this image is here is just to show you the complexity of the nuclear pore and this structure serves as a sieve in a sense to allow only molecules that have particular signals to come in and not everything to be able to diffuse across the nuclear pore. This uh, transmittance electron microscope image is showing you the nuclear uh, envelope from two different positions. From the cytoplasmic phase you can see the entrance of the nuclear pores with the spikes showing up and from the nucleoplasmic view you can see the nuclear plasmic cages that are formed, sort of like the sieve that is helping uh, remove and control the transport of molecules across the membrane of the nucleus. So this interesting complex, the nuclear pore complex, is required for the transport of RNA from the inside of the cell to the outside 
It's uh, of the nucleus, excuse me. It's required for the transport of um, transcription factors that are activated in the cytoplasm inside the nucleus, and it's required for the movement of molecules. And what I'm going to show you now is the mechanism involved in this process. So again, how do we know that there is a nuclear localization signal? So in this kind of experiment, they found the nuclear localization signal, which uh, contains proline, so we have prolines, lysines, and arginines, and valines, so it's the PPKKKRKV sequence, and they decided, you know what, if this is true an allocation signal, we can put it on a cytoplasmic protein and see where it goes. So the first image over here in A shows a fibroblast that has um, a protein tag with GSP, and that protein is exclusively uh, retained within the cytoplasm. When we, we put now the nuclear localization sequence in, the protein gets transported exclusively inside the nucleus, as shown here in B. So we know that we have the right sequence. And that allows them to um, understand that proteins that have this motif will be transported across the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So now, in order to have that protein sequence, you need to have a receptor to bind to it. And while we have a receptor, it's called the nuclear input receptor, shown here, where this squiggly is. So you have a protein that is going to be transported. Here is the protein in green. And in dark green, you have the nuclear localization signal that is going to be bound by the nuclear input receptor and transported across the um, nuclear pore complex inside the nucleus, into the nucleoplasm. Over there it will be disengaged and now the protein is ready to do its job. So you're going to require protein binding to the transport receptor. The transport receptor will have to engage the nuclear pore to allow it to go across and you will have to open the nuclear pore to allow the protein to move inside. So let's take a look to see some of the mechanisms that this is by which this is done. So let's begin by having this protein here. Looks like a little pill. Um, this is the cargo protein destined to the nucleus, and in red you have the nuclear localization signal. That protein is going to be bound by the nuclear transport receptor, the S, the blue S squiggly um, shown here. It's going to interact with the nuclear pore complex and it's going to be transported inside. Now, here is where a different protein that is a GTP switch comes into play, and this protein is called RAN. RAN, GTP, is able to bind to the nuclear transport receptor and help disassociate the cargo protein. Now, the cargo protein remains in the nucleoplasm and you have now the complex of the nuclear transport receptor bound to RAN, GTP. That protein, it's now that protein complex is now targeted to exit the nucleus and is going to exit the nucleus through a nuclear pore. Inside the cytoplasm, RAN, it's going to, by its GTPase activity, it's going to hydrolyze GTP. And when it hydrolyzes GTP, the phosphate is going to go away. And now you have RAN GDP. And RAN GDP has a lot less affinity for the nuclear transport receptor, which is going to now be free. When the nuclear transport receptor is free, it's now available to bind other proteins destined to the nucleus. And therefore, it frees the nuclear transport receptor to restart the cycle again. So what happens to RAN GDP? Well, RAN GDP is now in the cytoplasm, where it doesn't, uh, after it perform its function of transporting the molecule outside. So it's going to bind in the cytoplasm to a transporter factor called NOT F2. And NOT F2 is going to transport the RAND GTP into the nucleoplasm again. Inside, inside the nucleoplasm, RAND GDP will interact with a guanine exchange factor that is going to help replace GDP for GTP, recharging now RAND GTP to be able to bind to another nuclear transport receptor that has brought cargo inside, repeating the cycle. So you have the recycling of the nuclear transport receptor and you have the recycling of the RAN 
GDP back to GTP with the effect of the parting not F2. So that it makes it easy for transport of proteins inside the nucleus. What we're going to look now is how um, proteins are going to be transported across other membranes and in this particular we're going to be looking at the mitochondria and uh, ER. As you remember, proteins that are going to be transported into the mitochondria are going to have a signal sequence that is going to be understood by the system to allow them to be transported into the mitochondria. So to explain this process, I'm going to show you this image of the mitochondria in this movie. Mitochondria are organelles that have their own DNA and can make their own proteins. However, a vast majority of mitochondrial proteins are encoded in the nucleus and translated into protein in the cytosol. Proteins made in the cytosol must therefore be sorted and selectively delivered to their proper destinations. Precursor proteins destined for a mitochondrion have a short segment of amino acids, the signal sequence, that targets the proteins to this organelle. The signal sequence has affinity for a receptor on the mitochondrion surface and delivers the precursor protein to a translocation apparatus for import. At a contact site where the mitochondrion's two membranes are close together, the precursor protein snakes in an unfolded state through two sequential protein translocators, one in each of the mitochondrial membranes. Inside the mitochondrion, chaperone proteins are required to help pull the protein in. Chaperone proteins bind to the precursor protein as it appears on the inside of the mitochondrion and thereby prevent the protein chain from backsliding through the translocation tunnel. Once inside, an enzyme called a signal peptidase cleaves the signal sequence, which is no longer needed, from the precursor. The chaperone proteins are released as the protein chain folds into its three-dimensional structure. So a couple of things that are going to be interesting here. As you remember, the mitochondrion has its own genome. However, not all the proteins that are intended for the mitochondrial are encoded by the mitochondrial genome. Some of them are going to be in the nucleus. And therefore, they're going, the RNA for those proteins will be made in the nucleus, will be transcribed from the genes in the nucleus, and the proteins uh, will be translated in the cytoplasm. Now, those proteins are translated and kept as um, unfolded by chaperones. Those chaperones um, are going to prevent the protein from assuming a conformation that is going to be functional. Now, as I mentioned, those proteins in the cytoplasm that are targeted and destined for the mitochondria, are they need to cross two membranes, the outer membrane of the mitochondria and the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So to transport proteins across to the matrix of the mitochondria, we need a double membrane transport system. Now, the signal sequence in those proteins is going to be recognized by an import receptor protein on the outer membrane of this mitochondria. And that outer membrane complex is going to be attached by a protein translocator in the outer membrane. Once a protein binds to the receptor, it will diffuse until um, in the outer membrane, but it will start being translocated in the inside. As it's being translocated, it's going to be starting up. Another um, internal translocator in the inner membrane is going to help these proteins now move through. And as the mitochondria protein is being transported, it's being unfolded to be able to be transported across as a single peptide. Once it has been completely transported inside the matrix of the mitochondria, an enzyme called the signal peptidase is going to cleave away the signal peptide, and therefore now you have a mature protein that is ready for action. Let me show you then some slides about how that works a little bit more. This process, I forgot, requires energy. Now, here from the Lotus book, we have an image of a protein that is destined for the mitochondria and this protein shown here in one it's bound by chaperones those chaperones are called cytosolic hsc70 they are they're able to hydrolyze atp into adp and pi to keep the protein unfolded 
And as you see from here in pink at the very amino terminal of the protein, you have the um, matrix targeting sequence or the signal sequence that is going to allow that protein to go inside the mitochondria. As we discussed early, that's going to be recognized by a receptor in the surface of the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Eventually, they will diffuse and find a channel. That channel is called TOM, TOM40. And TOM40 is going to be able to be bind to the um, signal peptide until it diffuses and finds a contact site within the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the mitochondria, where it's going to now find another receptor called TEM. So this receptor complex TIM is going to now bind to the nuclear, uh, to the matrix targeting sequence, excuse me, and is going to allow it to be channeled. Inside the matrix of the mitochondria, you have now a different set of HSC70. This is going to be matrix HSC70, and they're going to bind to the uh, protein and use ATP hydrolysis to pull it inside. Once the entire protein has been pulled inside, that signal peptidase is going to remove the uh, target sequence and now the protein is going to be able to um, fold to allow its function. So this is just a bigger image of what I just discussed for you guys. Um, the TOM receptor in the outside is going to be able, TOM is for trans location in the outer membrane, and TIM is for translocator in the inner membrane, so TOM and TIM, so it's easy to remember. Um, it's going to mediate the transport of the protein across the double membrane by using ATP hydrolysis from the matrix HSC70 proteins, which are going to be pulling the protein inside the matrix as they are hydrolyzing GTP, I'm snaking it all the way in. And as I mentioned, once inside the um, matrix, the signal sequence will be cleave, allowing the protein to fold properly and do its function. The last system that I want to discuss with you is going to be the system that is required to translocate proteins across the endoplasmic reticulum. And as you remember from what we have shown, the endoplasmic reticulum is a really vast network of membrane that spans the entire cell. Inside the area of the endoplasmic reticulum, you have a specialized portion where, as you can see here in the TM image on the right, it has ribosomes. And those ribosomes are going to be uh, attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, forming what we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Those ribosomes are actively translating proteins that are being translocated across the membrane. Now, what we have discussed in the past in Bio2, for example, is the fact that inside the cell you have two different parallel systems of protein translation. One of them, um, and, and, and before we go there, those two systems are going to have a common pool of ribosomal subunits. So mRNAs that are uh, destined to generate proteins that are going to stay in the cytoplasm and be free are bound by ribosomes and the ribosome complex will form a polyribosome that is going to translate that protein and once you get to the end the, the ribosome system disengages and now you have the protein that has been generated in the cytoplasm and that protein stays around. So you have a recycling um, of ribosomes that are reading proteins in the ear, in the cytoplasm, excuse me, that is going to generate cytosolic proteins. But you also have a membrane-bound ribosome cycle, and that is going to bring nascent proteins that are targeted for the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and brings them into the ER, where they're going to be translocated or summed together on the surface of the ER membrane. And that is shown here at the bottom. So how is this happening? As we discussed before, the protein that is going to be targeted for the endoplasmic reticulum has a signal sequence, and that signal sequence has to be recognized by a receptor. That receptor is called the signal recognition particle. So when a ribosome binds a RNA molecule that encodes for a ER-bound protein, as the ribosome becomes translating the protein, you're going to have the signal sequence coming out of the ribosome. That will be the first thing that will come out. And at that point, 
the signal recognition particle can immediately bind to it and that's going to direct the protein complex, the ribosome protein and the mRNA complex onto the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum where you're going to have a signal recognition particle receptor. The signal recognition particle receptor is nicely associated with a protein translocator and it will then be able to direct the protein that is currently being made through this channel to allow it to be translocated across the ear membrane. This process is going to use the energy of translation. Remember that the ribosome is a uh, hydrolyzing GDP to be able to perform its function and therefore it's going to be able to start to push the protein through the channel as it is being made. So now without showing the uh, ribosome to so take it out for simplicity um, what we have is the protein that is nascently being generated and is now being held in the protein translocator and as the protein is being pushed through by the ribosome is being made eventually you're going to have the entire protein come through the signal sequence will be removed by a signal peptidase that um, leads it out clips it out and that it will diffuse across the membrane and later will be destroyed um, but the protein it's going to be translocated completely across the uh, membrane of the ER and therefore now be present in the lumen. Now, so notice that this protein is soluble and therefore, for example, if this could be a factor that needs to be released, eventually we're going to discuss how this factor that is going to be like this uh, cytokine or uh, protein like insulin eventually will make it to the plasma membrane. But right now, um, let's just keep it here in the lumen of the ER. So first it has to be made inside and placed inside the ear and later it's going to be transported out. Now a transmembrane protein is going to have a very similar process except that you're going to have that start sequence that's going to be the signal sequence we call it also the start sequence and that's going to be fairly hydrophobic to allow the protein to be translocated uh, on the membrane. Eventually, the hydrophobic stop transfer sequence, or the 20 amino acid signal uh, transmembrane region, will come through. That point, as the second portion, that stop sequence is being passed through, it's going to reach the translocator. At that point, uh, you can also have the removal of the signal peptidase, but when the stop transfer sequence enters the channel, it will be expelled outside, because if the channel is still very hydrophilic and the protein that is now coming through is quite hydrophobic and now that protein is going to be embedded in the ER membrane. So that will be for example a single transmember protein um, where you have the 20 amino acid uh, alpha helix that crosses the membrane. So here's the alpha helix as you have uh, discussed earlier and the and shown to the right is going to be that as uh, the star sequence or the um, nuclear, I mean the ER translocation sequence, remove and later degrade it. Now a protein that is going to have multiple passes is going to have um, the start and signal in different places. So the start signal could be placed in the middle of the protein. So the protein will start to be translated by the ribosome. Eventually the hydrophobic start transfer sequence it's going to be made. That star sequence will be bound by the SRP brought into the complex will be brought into the ER membrane by the SRP receptor and there it's going to start translocating. Once it is translocating uh, eventually you can have now the hydrophobic stop transfer sequence coming in. In this case now both of those membrane regions are going to be retained within the ER membrane and now the protein has double pass by having two different transmembrane regions present in the ER membrane. Notice here that the um, this hydrophobic start transfer sequence it not removed as when it happens in the proteins that have only have one pass transmembrane region. So as you remember from a different class in bio at the beginning of the class uh, in bio 110 um, 
we have a hydropathic plot that is going to show us the areas um, where the transmembrane region is located. So here in the glycophorin, you have one single transmembrane region, and in the bacterial rhodopsin, which is a seven transmembrane channel, you have seven different regions. So as it's easy to input a protein that has only one transmembrane region, but the process to input a protein with seven transmembrane regions is a little bit more complicated. So what you have is that one of those regions is going to be the start sequence, and then after that, the other region could be another start sequence and a stop sequence. So you're going to have combinations of start and stop sequences that are going to allow the protein to be sawn into the ER membrane by having a start and stop sequence that can detach, another start and stop sequence that is going to allow the input of the second portion, and a final start and stop sequence that is going to allow the generation of the last portion. Let me show you this in this film. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, is the most extensive membrane system in eukaryotic cells. Proteins transported to the Golgi apparatus, endosomes, lysosomes, and the cell surface all must first enter the ER from the cytosol. As an mRNA molecule is translated into a protein, many ribosomes bind to it, forming a polyribosome. There are two separate populations of polyribosomes in the cytosol that share the same pool of ribosomal subunits. Free ribosomes are unattached to any membrane. Membrane-bound ribosomes become riveted to the ER membrane and translate proteins that are translocated into the ER. These membrane-bound ribosomes coat the surface of the ER, creating regions called rough endoplasmic reticulum. Two kinds of proteins are moved from the cytosol to the ER. Water-soluble proteins completely cross the ER membrane and are released into the lumen, while transmembrane proteins only partially cross the ER and become embedded in the membrane. All these proteins are directed to the ER by a signal sequence of small hydrophobic amino acids. The signal sequence is guided to the ER membrane with a signal recognition particle, or SRP, which binds the ER signal sequence in the new protein as it emerges from the ribosome. Protein synthesis then slows down until the SRP ribosome complex binds to an SRP receptor in the ER membrane. The SRP is then released, passing the ribosome to a protein translocation channel in the ER membrane. Thus, the SRP and SRP receptor function as molecular matchmakers, connecting ribosomes that are synthesizing proteins containing ER signal sequences to available ER translocation channels. In addition to directing proteins to the ER, the signal sequence functions to open the translocation channel. The signal peptide remains bound to the channel, while the rest of the protein chain is threaded through the membrane as a large loop. Once the protein has passed through the membrane, it is released into the ER lumen. After the signal sequence has been cleaved off by a signal peptidase located on the luminal side of the ER membrane. The signal peptide is then released from the translocation channel into the membrane and rapidly degraded. It is thought that a protein serving as a plug then binds from the ER lumen to close the inactive channel. But not all proteins that enter the ER are released into the ER lumen. Some remain embedded in the ER membrane as transmembrane proteins. For clarity's sake, the membrane-bound ribosome will be omitted to illustrate the translocation of transmembrane proteins into the ER membrane. In the simplest case, that of a transmembrane protein with a single membrane-spanning segment, the N-terminal signal sequence initiates translocation, just as for a soluble protein. But the transfer process is halted by an additional sequence of hydrophobic amino acids, a stop transfer sequence, further in the polypeptide chain. The stop transfer sequence is released laterally from the translocation channel and drifts into the plane of the lipid bilayer, where it forms a membrane-spanning segment that anchors the protein in the membrane. As a result, the translocated protein ends up as a transmembrane protein inserted in the membrane with a defined orientation. In some transmembrane proteins, an internal signal sequence is used to start the protein transfer, which continues until a stop transfer sequence is reached. The two hydrophobic sequences are then released into the bilayer where they remain anchored. In complex multipass proteins, in which many hydrophobic regions span the bilayer, 
additional pairs of stop and start sequences come into play. One sequence reinitiates translocation further down the polypeptide chain, and the other stops translocation and causes polypeptide release, and so on, for subsequent starts and stops. Thus, multipass membrane proteins are stitched into the lipid bilayer as they are being synthesized by a mechanism resembling a sewing machine. All right. So that image, that movie, excuse me, clarifies some of the points about protein translocation in the ER. But multiple things also can happen as the proteins, so multiple things are going to happen as the protein is being translocated in the ER membrane. One of the things that happens at the ER is the, is the addition of glycosylation. So glycosylation motifs or the sugar complex motifs are going to be added as the protein is being made into the ER. This initial glycosylation motifs are going to be added by the recognition of asparagine motifs in the protein. So when the asparagine amino acid having a particular sequence flanking, so there's going to be a signal that is going to be used by the glycosylation uh, machinery present in the ER. The glycolipid um, having the uh, carbohydrate moiety, it's maintained in the lumen of the ER by the dolicochol um, lipid and that has two phosphates that are keeping it attached. So as the protein is being translocated across the ER membrane and the sequence containing a particular asparagine shows up, so there's going to be a particular uh, sequence being recognized, now you will then have the transfer of the oligosaccharide complex into the protein and that is now going to allow for the glycosylation of this transmembrane protein. Now, as we discussed earlier, glycosylation works to help the protein be prevented from degradation. It's going to allow the protein to also be served as a transport signal and in the surface of the cell is going to form the glycocalyx that is going to help the cell and protected from the environment. The other thing that could happen within the ER it's the addition of a um, GPI link. So a protein that has been translocated across the ER membrane to the mechanism that we just discussed will then be recognized by a particular sequence that it has to allow the transfer of the GPI link to it. And now that protein is going to be um, bound to the um, ER by a GPI link. So that will then, the portion of the protein that was uh, holding it in the membrane, it's now removed and it's going to be degraded quickly. But this is how the proteins that are GPI linked are added directly. And as you know, for example, by discussing the proteins that are the uh, um, monomeric or the trimeric G proteins, those are held together in the ER by lipid linkage. So that stops the lecture for today, and I will post this up for you, and we'll talk about it later. Thank you very much.